Hello, I'm Peter Knight and this is number 8 in our series of short lectures about geomorphology. Remember, if I go too fast for you to read what's on each slide, you can use the pause button to slow me down. So far in these lectures, we've discussed some of the big issues that underpin the whole of geomorphology. You're now ready to go out and start applying these big ideas to specific case studies in geomorphology and using them to help you think about why landscape works the way it does and why it looks the way it does. This lecture is a very short case study looking at one geomorphic environment and seeing how some of our big themes show up in this particular example. There's plenty of accessible literature where you can get more information about the key processes and features. I'm just going to focus briefly on the factors that control the form of volcanic landforms and the ways that we can respond to volcanic hazards. Volcanic landforms come in all different shapes and sizes. Here, for example, we have a conical stratovolcano, a plateau formed from sheets of volcanic basalt, and a heavily eroded volcanic plug. Which of these various forms occurs depends on a set of interrelated factors. For example, the tectonic settings, such as whether the site is at a convergent plate boundary, a mid-ocean ridge, or an intraplate hotspot, will control the properties of the magma, which in turn will determine whether an eruption is explosive or effusive. This will also depend partly on environment, for example, whether the extrusion happens underwater or on dry land or under a glacier. Different materials behave differently in different environments. For example, fluid lavas produced in mid-ocean settings flow long distances before solidifying, producing flat shield volcanoes like those in Hawaii, whereas more viscous lavas flow less far, producing steeper volcanoes. The final form also depends on its long-term evolution, both within the volcanic system and during its subsequent post-volcanic time. For example, the volcano Chimborazo in Ecuador has developed its distinctive morphology through a series of eruptive phases that have each added a new section to the volcano. By contrast, Mount St. Helens has been through a destructive phase of its evolution, with a large part of the edifice being destroyed uh, by the 1980 eruption. A useful exercise would be to identify from the literature as many features of volcanic geomorphology as you can and to relate the origin and morphology of each one both to the controlling factors I've suggested and also to the big issues that we've covered in previous lectures. My second question is what can we do about volcanic hazards? Many different processes associated with volcanic activity are potentially hazardous and we saw in a previous lecture predicting a hazard is the key to mitigation. Consider Cotopaxi Volcano as an example. The geomorphology of the volcano and its surrounding area provide clues to the style of its previous eruptions, and hence to the threat that it poses. The volcano's flanks are clearly marked by lava flows, layers of volcanic ash. This satellite image clearly reveals the tracks of volcanic mud flows, and these are also clear on the ground. Given that these mud flows tend to follow the same tracks repeatedly, I wouldn't have built my holiday chalet just there. And this hummocky topography at Cotopaxi indicates that a debris avalanche similar to that which occurred at Mount St. Helens in 1980 also previously occurred here. The geomorphic evidence gives us a clear picture of the types of processes associated with the volcano and hence the types of hazard. Prediction is possible because the processes are geographically specific and because features from past events are recognisable. This enables us to produce hazard maps, such as this one produced for Mount Rainier by the US Geological Survey, showing where particular processes are likely to strike. So our response to volcanic hazards can be divided into three stages. Monitoring the volcano and predicting what may happen, assessing the hazard, and setting measures in place to deal with it. There are many different techniques for keeping an eye on volcanoes to give us early warning of likely events. Understanding the volcano and knowing what's likely to happen then allows us to produce a hazard map and a risk assessment for specific locations. On the basis of that assessment, measures can then be put in place. These might include planning in advance to avoid areas where hazards may strike, or, if it's too late for that, measures for diverting or avoiding the process. For example, there's been some success in pumping cold water onto lava flows to block their progress. There's also been some success in bombing lava tubes to block or divert the flow of lava. And earth barriers have been used for the same purpose. So volcanoes provide an example of some of the big themes we've discussed previously. The landforms relate to the processes and the geomorphology is relevant to human activity. This lecture has only scratched the surface but I hope it's given you some things to think about as you now go and explore this and other case studies of geomorphology on your own.